So we kind of have a special guest who I don't think was on the original agenda. So thanks to um, to um, Calvin. Calvin for arranging this at the last <laughs> minute. Sorry, I had to, I'm looking at his face and the name is like completely gone. How uh, quickly you're forgotten, Calvin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that guy. <laughs> No, thank you very much, Caitlin, uh -huh. for being here with us today. Um, and we're going we're gonna to jump right in. So recently, we've seen increasingly severe attacks on critical infrastructure like Colonial Pipeline, for example. What was your reaction when you first heard about that attack? Um, and what impact have these attacks had on your role um, in the National Security Council? Okay, before I jump into that, first of all, I want to congratulate you Thank on you. becoming interim executive director of NCSA. Thanks for um, Also, I guess this is year 18 of doing the cybersecurity right. summit. Uh, and so thank you very much when I was at DHS, uh, um, in part, thanks to Christina Dorvier. Uh, you know, we got involved in, in uh, supporting you and your efforts. Uh, and I think it's so important that we continue to shine a light on cybersecurity and the importance of raising um, standards, and that's why we have National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which comes to an end uh, in November, but then we'll transition to my favorite month, which is Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience Month. <laughs> yes, I have been in and out of government far too long. <laughs> but thank you for having me here today. I just thought it was Thanksgiving. That's... <laughs> okay, no, little did you know. Um, I was on my way back from New York City when I first got uh, the news about Colonial Pipeline, and it came across as an um, alert uh, from the White House that um, there had been a ransomware attack against Colonial Pipeline. And it certainly um, piqued my ears in part because of my previous work at the Department of Homeland Security, and we had spent um, resources through, in, through various programs trying to better understand what a cyber attack on the OT side of, of a pipeline might look like and what impacts that you might see, as well as um, thinking about the resilience, not just of colonial pipelines, but other pipelines and to cyber attacks to um, other natural hazards. And so when we first got word, um, you know, I, I followed with interest because at this point we thought it had just been a ransomware attack on the IT side of the house. Um, by early Saturday morning, it uh, was clear that it had propagated into the physical domain. Um, but what was really interesting about it, it was not the cyber attack, um, but it was actually the decision by the company uh, to shut the, the pipeline down. And this is the first time in the, um, uh, I think, 45 or 50 year history of Colonial Pipeline that the entirety of the pipeline had ever been shut down. And this is a 55,000, uh, 5, uh, 5, pipeline. And, it's easier to start up a portion of it after a hurricane, restarting um, the entire pipeline is a whole different uh, ball game. And so over the course of the weekend, it became clear that the impact of this ransomware attack was um, both going to be more consequential than we thought, uh, and that it was gonna stretch out a little bit as the company worked to, to figure this out. Um, it very quickly highlighted something that we've been talking um, about a long time in government, which is the convergence of cyber and physical, and that it's really hard to keep these two things um, siloed anymore. And so it enabled um, us uh, in, in, in the White House really to, to attack this, not just from um, the cyber perspective, but thinking about how um, we do response, which is really what I, what I focus on in the, in the White House, um, but also um, very quickly shining a light on the economic um, impacts. Uh, and so it became kind of a whole of White House effort um, to lead the response um, between my directorate, what we call Pound Cyber, uh, and also, also the National Economic Council because of the impacts that we were seeing at local, to supply and local gas stations. Uh, it also highlighted, I think, some of the, the um, gaps that we have in incident response policy. And there are probably five or six um, policies that guide how we do incident response across the federal government um, to include, um, you know, a, a, something that's called HSPD-5 that, that dates back to 20 years. You have the Stafford Act that looks at um, uh, responses to natural hazards and FEMA largely manages 
um, that effort through the National Response Framework. There's something called PPD 41, which is the cyber response policy. Then you have PPD 21. Like I could go on and bore you with policy, which is not really my intention. Um, but was, what was interesting about it is that no, not one of these policies kind of perfectly fit um, this incident that we were having. Again, one that started as a cyber attack in the IT side and, and quickly cascaded into the physical domain, um, not just having physical consequences, but economic consequences. And so um, it has certainly uh, caused us to pause and to um, begin to think about the need to evaluate uh, overall response policy across the federal government. I think it also um, did uh, emphasize um, that much of our infrastructure, and I say this having been in the critical infrastructure space for 20 years, and this sounds like a no doubt to most of you in this room, but um, for those that are new to government, um, most of our infrastructure is not owned or operated by the federal government, but is owned by the private sector or by state and local governments. Um, and so how we work with them to respond to an incident of this magnitude um, for a, a administration that was early in its term, um, I think underscored the importance of, of public-private partnerships and the, and the need to continue um, building these uh, relationships. And so um, I think that's you know, part of the value that, that I brought to the equation in addition to understanding um, response uh, policy and, you know, the various mechanisms and levers that we had available to us to um, help the company and to um, speed response, uh, but also that when you're working with the private sector, the kind of unity of effort, unity of messaging was really important. And I will tell you, we were engaged with the company at various levels, you know, 24-7, um, with um, Ann Neuberger speaking with the CEO on a regular basis. We had teams that were working with them in addition to the efforts that we had ongoing with CISA, um, with the Department of Energy, with the FBI, both to understand what had happened, um, to see if we could um, you know, get a better sense of who was behind it, but also, again, to um, do what we do in these incidents, which is uh, raise attention and ensure the rest of the sector was aware of what was going on uh, and was taking appropriate measures. The other thing that I will just say is that it, that it um, certainly highlighted the importance of all of the supply chain work that we are doing right now in this administration, both on the ICT side of the house um, but just the, the fragility of the supply chain in this COVID era. And we were trying to figure out there was um, plenty of supply. It was, we had a couple of issues. There was plenty of supply. It was how we got it from point A to the, the gas stations. And when you have a shortage of truck drivers, um, right. it, you know, you're, you can't make, you know, a thousand truck drivers materialize over, mm -hmm. overnight. That was part of the challenge. Um, and then, you know, the need when you talk about unity of effort and unity of messaging, part of the supply problem was really because there was a run on gas. Again, it wasn't because there was a supply, but as you think through um, how you're going to message these things, the need for the whole of government, whole of community to work in response to ensure that you're really mitigating um, the impact. So it was a great early test um, for the administration. We did a hot wash and a lesson learned um, afterwards. More federal government included CISA and FBI, and it has certainly now shaped how we respond to um, other events. And there have been a lot of ransomware events um, where we uh, very quickly with Pound Cyber come together and um, work with the agencies that are involved in the response to ensure that we as an administration are doing everything we can to speed response uh, and minimize the impacts. Uh, have any critical infrastructure sec sectors been hit harder than others? So we talked a little bit about the pipeline. Um, any comments about other? Uh, I have Sorry, lots of comments about that. First of all, <laughs> I, I don't think that it is easy to say um, one sector has been hit more than another, uh, and that's in part because we don't always know who's been hit. Uh, and this is something that we have been trying to do as a federal government is encourage um, private sector companies when they are the victim of attack um, to contact the CISA, to, CISA right. to contact the FBI. Um, and it's both in part because there are services that, that we um, can bring um, to help 
uh, again, get companies back up on their feet, but it's the forensics piece um, in understanding what happened in part because we want to be able to share that information um, with the sector or across critical infrastructure and have um, the ability uh, to, to connect the dots. We may be seeing things in other sectors uh, and you know, that, that visibility is, is important. Um, I will also you know, say that I don't think our adversaries think of this from a sector perspective. Um, they think about it from the weakest link. Uh, and um, someone mentioned it you know, earlier uh, uh, today, but the, it's really, um, you know, our adversaries are patient. Uh, they spend a lot of time looking for the weakest link for those, I'm, I'm going to use a, target, a, a term that we use in the physical side a lot, but I think it applies to cyber, for those soft targets. Um, they, you know, um, using, you know, some of the kind of human factors that uh, the la uh, Perry just talked about, um, you know, they understand how to get into these um, systems um, through, um, you know, sphere phishing, and then they, you know, launch their attack. And sometimes it's not noticeable. They're patient, and they can work their way from, you know, one company to another. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that there is one sector that is mo more vulnerable or more the target than in the other. We've seen it in the energy sector. We've seen it um, in food and ag. We've seen it in the baking sector. Uh, in the in the United Kingdom, certainly the the, the health uh, and medical sector has been a victim of a lot of ransomware attacks. Um, so you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's really who's 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 vulnerable, and it's why it's important that we work um, to push that cyber hygiene message um, and to raise cybersecurity practices um, across all sectors. It's not a matter of if, right? It's when. Um, and it can be when, you know, time and time again. And so uh, I think that, again, across industry, we've got to continue to raise the importance of good cyber hygiene. So what are your top priorities in your role to secure critical national infrastructure? That uh, is a great uh, question. Um, I think the, the first um, priority is really continuing to help advance the president and the administration's Build Back Better um, agenda. I've been in uh, this um, space for a long time uh, and understand how a aging and failing uh, infrastructure um, is creating uh, more vulnerabilities, whether it is uh, to natural hazards, to um, asymmetric attacks like cyber attacks. Um, we're dealing with climate change. We just saw Nor'easter roll through here. We've had crazy wildfires, um, Ida, you know, ran from Louisiana to um, New York and had devastating impacts and in its own part because uh, our infrastructure is uh, aging and failing. But um, the, the second piece of that is really raising attention and putting us on a spotlight on the fact that um, as we modernize and we become an increasingly digitized, electrified, um, connected infrastructure ecosystem, that security has to count for the the um, for for that reality, right? And you can't just think about how you secure um, your own systems and your own assets, but you have to think about the things um, that you're dependent on and that are dependent on you. And if there is um, some sort of disruption uh, to a downstream or upstream uh, supplier um, entity that you have a relationship with, how is it going? How is it going to impact you? So really highlighting um, the, uh, the the convergence of, um, uh, of 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 the supply chain of of the interconnected, interdependent nature in, in which we now um, regularly kind of operate in. I think the other um, priority is working with Nitin and Jen uh, at CISA and across the interagency um, to reshape and modernize how we think about critical infrastructure protection. Uh, it is, um, you know, for the last 20 years, uh, we've operated under um, a voluntary uh, partnership. Um, it has served us well. Um, how do we continue to build on that voluntary partnership, uh, recognizing that we're living in a very, um, I think, a more complex uh, risk environment um, with a lot of different um, actors, um, ranging from Mother Nature to increasing nation um, state actors, and, and I think that we have to continue to strengthen 
those entities in the federal government that work with the private sector to make sure that they have the capacity and the expertise to um, uh, help uh, our private sectors, you know, quickly, our private sector partners quickly get back up on their um, feet. And it used to be, and I'm going to use the uh, Department of U.S. Department of Agriculture as an, ex an example, right? Um, you know, you don't think of them as having a strong um, cyber uh, mm -hmm. expertise, um, but when you look at the JBS ransomware attack, there's been some attacks against some grain um, uh, storage uh, entities. Um, increasingly, um, you know, they need the capacity to uh, better understand what the impacts are going to be of these attacks uh, and um, how widespread they might be, what the economic consequences, do we have a national security issue, and so this is the role kind of a, of a sector risk management agency for the financial services sector, it's treasury, um, it, you know, for the communications sector, it's, it's CISA, but how do we make sure that they have um, the, the, the capabilities, the expertise, the human capital um, to be a good partner to our, our private sector partners who, again, own and operate the critical infrastructure that we're dependent on from an economic and a national security standpoint. So you mentioned the, the current administration's priorities and during your time at CISA, you saw a lot of administrations come and go. Um, what's changed in the, in the government approaches to securing the critical infrastructure during the time you were at CISA? Uh, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, I think there are a number of, of things that have, have changed. First of all, I will tell you um, that it is rare, and I served in the Obama administration, and the um, our our uh, the first secretary under Obama, uh, Janet Napolitano, was very clear that our job was to um, make sure that we left uh, the place in, in in a better place than than we got it. Um, I think that uh, under Chris Krebs's leadership, um, CISA certainly grew uh, and um, was one part of the federal government that they actually took to a better place than we had left it. Uh, and CISA has become really this, this um, incredible entity who is, that is not just responsible for working with the private sector, but is protecting our democratic institutions. Uh, and it's really exciting to see my former agency um, have been kind of elevated and, and um, have this, you know, great, great reputation. Um, I think the understanding of the uh, role that the private sector plays in our national security and our economic security, again, there's greater awareness of that. Uh, and, and that, um, again, the federal government doesn't own much of our critical infrastructure, and it's really important. Uh, for us uh, to find ways to support and work with the owner operator community. So I think greater recognition of the role uh, that critical infrastructure plays. I think the coordination um, within the federal government when it comes to supporting uh, the private sector in, in the response. And I will tell you, I remember when I was at NPPD, which was the predecessor to CISA, you'd go to a room and you'd give a talk and you say, if you've got a, you know, a question or you have an incident call, Call, call NPPD, and then an FBI colleague would get up and talk about what the FBI said, and then if you've got a problem, call the FBI, and, you know, every, every three-letter, four-letter agency would say, call me, and the private sector would be like, well, okay, who am I supposed to call? Um, I do think that there now is um, much more coordination and collaboration that helps, that, that, that happens between those federal entities, and I've seen it in um, the, you know, colonial pipeline response in JBS that CISA and FBI and the intelligence community are working together. There's collaboration, there's sharing of information. Um, so I think that that's um, uh, come a, a long way. Um, I also, you know, um, I think the, the concept of resilience uh, is really taking hold. I mean, we tried to push some initiatives during the Obama administration. Um, resilience is certainly kind of the, the word de jour, and I always like to ask when it's uh, someone's on a panel talking about resilience, um, how they define it and what it means. Um, but I think this recognition now that we have to do a better job anticipating uh, what's coming uh, and trying to get ahead of it, looking at those emerging threats and learning the lessons of whether it's the commercialization of the internet, the advent of IoT, how do we start to bake security in from the beginning, really security um, by design and, and get ahead of uh, the threats. I think that's when you talk about, you know, 
priorities of my directorate at the NSC as we do um, move out on the Build Back Better and, and hopefully we're gonna get an infrastructure bill, making sure that we're bringing um, that principle um, to, uh, to the implementation of it, that we've got to think about the world that we live in now, um, but also what the world's going to look like 20 to 30 years from now, and that we're accounting for that as we build and, and modernize um, the infrastructure. So there's the anticipation part. I think that's a, a key um, aspect of what resilience is. And then to steal a, a uh, definition that Tom Fanning, who's the CEO of Southern Company, uses when he talks about resilience. Um, it's not uh, a, just about the ability to operate in normal conditions, but it's how you operate in abnormal. Um, and this is what, you know, we have to continue to, to get better at. And I will tell you, almost any one of the incidents that we've had um, during the course of the last nine months certainly did not play out the way that we thought it would play. And whether it's the winter storm and the failure of the grid in Texas, um, certainly Colonial Pipeline, um, they don't, you know, they never happen like you think they're going to happen. No, no plan survives contact. No scenario ever really plays out the way that you um, think it's going to. And so it's that ability um, to continue to operate in, in abnormal that's really important. So resilience, the evolution of resilience. And I think we have to, to get on that one and take it seriously. So we have a lot of private industry folks here and people dialed in remotely. What do you, what do you need from private industry? Uh, thank you, you very much for that question. First of all, I want to just begin by um, thanking uh, our, our private sector um, partners. I've known and worked with many of you for the course of the last 20 years. Um, I will say that we need your continued um, collaboration. You know, I have been on this stage over the course, not this actual stage, but on the stage, <laughs> Um, over the course of the last 16 years with many of the, the same messages, um, which is uh, we need to hear from you um, when, uh, when you're the victim of an attack. It's as important for you as it is for others in the sector and the critical infrastructure community. So that sharing of information um, helps us create a more um, resilient and robust um, community overall. Uh, you know, I think we are in a place where um, there is more of a recognition and embracing that this cyber security thing is, is it, we've gone from nuisance to, wow, this can have real world, I mean, pretty significant economic and national security impacts. Uh, and so um, embracing, you know, I think what are um, best practices that we have touted over many administrations uh, is really important, and that's two, you know, two-factor authentication, making sure you're doing your patching, empowering um, your your employees, especially on the cyber IT side of the house. Um, you know, make sure that you have a plan when there's a cyber incident. Segment your networks. Um, Anne's recent, I think, July letter laid out a lot of what it was a letter to CEOs about what they should be doing. Please, please take this seriously. Uh, you know, I, I have been in enough, enough calls where I've heard industry partners say, okay, well, I guess we really now need to start doing this. It's, again, it's not a matter of if, um, it's a matter of when. Uh, and, and the more that you do now is the more that you know, you're gonna mitigate um, the impacts of this. I cannot um, underscore enough how important it is to think about if you are the victim of a cyber attack and whether it's a ransomware attack or whatever it may be, to think about how it could propagate into the physical side and make sure your IT and your cyber teams are talking to the physical, uh, you know, the all, in fact, all parts of the company are, are talking. Um, and to make time uh, to, um, you know, sit in a room and have conversations about how you would respond. And there are examples that happen every day, right? But how something might look in your environment and are you prepared are you ready the more you have those conversations you create those relationships you build that muscle memory the better um the better prepared you're going to be i think the last thing that i would ask is that uh you know we need to hear from you we the federal government about uh what's working what we can do to help um you know it's it's we we think we're doing the right thing uh, and that we're the government and we're here to help and sometimes we get it right sometimes we haven't shown the light on it appropriately and that's why we have sector coordinating councils in this 
you know, amazing um, authority called CPAP, which allows us to bring you the private sector into a room and have a private conversation uh, about security and where we can make enhancements and work together. Um, so get involved, use that. Um, we do, uh, you know, as, as Nitin will attest, take coming to the table very seriously and making sure that we're committed and there on a regular basis and across uh, the table to hear um, from our private sector partners about what we can be doing to help them. Um, so continue to leverage that uh, relationship. Um, and uh, I, think, I think those are the big things. Great, I've spent my whole career in private industry and so for a long time for me, everything that happened at the federal government level was just kind of behind a curtain. And um, it's good to hear that there's resources there. We did a panel discussion recently with um, somebody from one of the field offices from DHS and just the, the amount of resources that are there. I think people don't always understand in private industry, there, particularly in SMB, what's available to help you. There are a ton of resources mm -hmm. and not just on the cyber side. Mo, uh, Mo is here, one of our protective security advisors. Um, and I mean, we've got a, a wealth of, of also on the physical security side, right? I mean, ways to do assessments um, and we do them regular. We, I'm not at DHS anymore, but that's always going to kind of be my first home um, to help small and medium sized businesses and soft targets mm -hmm. understand with, you know, a, a minimal investment, how they can really enhance their, their security and, yeah. and resilience. When it comes so, to security, yeah. the government really is there to help you. Yes, yeah. we are. Yeah. 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 Um, we have time for questions. Any from the audience? Calvin, no, you're Calvin. hand up. Calvin <laughs> Coleman. <laughs> I, you are never going to let me live that down. I, I know that. Calvin <laughs> <laughs> uh, Coleman, IBM. Uh, Caitlin, historically, and for, with good reason, there's been some barriers and obstacles between government and private sector, right? Legal frameworks to keep the two apart. Um, and I think you just mentioned the seat that they considered uh -huh. in. What other mechanisms are there, and are there any coming up that sort of, you know, uh, uh, erase some of those barriers to make it easier for government and, and, and private sector to work together? Because you said, you know, most of the infrastructure is in the private sector hands. Yeah. So anything there coming up? To Calvin, I'm a, I have somewhat of a controversial answer to that, uh, um, okay. because I think Congress was incredibly um, uh, thoughtful when they crafted the Homeland Security Act of 2002 uh, to ensure that private sector and government could work together on matters of security. And the Homeland Security Act of 2002 is what did give birth to the, the CPAC authority that I'm talking to. And again, that's really the ability for the federal government to say, to go to the private sector and say, we need to convene you. We have a emerging security issues or for the purposes of home and security, we can do it outside of the public view. The private sector can provide advice and counsel and, and you know, we can act on it. That was one of the things they did. But um, they also created the, the PCII. I think that was the, the, I think that was the Homeland Security Act, but then we had to do the rulemaking. But that allows private industry to share vulnerability information with the government. And we, the federal government, has to um, be a good steward of the information that is provided, of that vulnerability information that is provided by the private sector. Um, and that's both and how we safeguard it, but it's um, not subject to FOIA, to state sunshine laws, and to regulators. Um, I think that is still, and it's hard to imagine, and I can say this about a lot of things, but that 20 years later, that's still not a, um, I, I think it's increased, but that, that there's still hesitancy for industry to use that. I will tell you, you know, in the time that I was at DHS, we took that responsibility to safeguard that information um, very seriously. Uh, and so that, that mechanism has been there. I think that sometimes and I know lawyers get a bad name, but lawyers, um, you know, they, they, they run from that and they've got their own concerns about things becoming public and they don't fully allow companies to embrace um, that protection. The Cybersecurity Act of 2015, Brett, thank you for that, um, provided additional kind of liability protections that's supposed to make it easier for industry uh, to share information. Um, I, you know, I think it's all there. It's just a matter of trust. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got companies who are very comfortable coming to the FBI and to CISA um, when there's an event to, to share information. Um, 
as well as realize the value of what the government can provide in terms of information sharing. And I think that's one of the things that we have gotten a lot better at is the threat information that we're providing to industry uh, and helping industry understand the so what and why it relates um, to them. But, you know, there are, there are certain sectors and certain companies who just don't feel comfortable uh, in sharing that information or, or may not think that their incident rises to the level of needing to, to contact the government. But at the end of the day, you know, it will help us um, better understand the adversary and who's, who's, you know, being targeted if we have that information. So I'm, I'm not um, dismissing what you, what you say, but I think that there's, you know, um, I, I, there's not a full appreciation really of, of how easy we've tried to make it to take um, information from industry and how seriously, and Elena um, and Nitin can talk to it and Mo, how seriously we take um, that responsibility, but it's, you know, it's about trust and you know this, you've, you know, you build trust by, by coming to the table and we demonstrate that we're going to do, we federal government, that we're going to do what we say we're going to do. And over time, you know, you're going to get there. But I think a lot of what we need is, is in place. I think people just hide behind the liability and the, you know, worried about their information being publicly shared. Full disclosure, I've worked with Elena, Christine, and Caitlin in this capacity before, but I'm going to kind of give an answer again. And I think the National Cybersecurity Alliance was an outgrowth of that 2002, not directly, but I just, I, I remember when Christine and I were working together that, I mean, she, she was intimately involved in all this. So, hi, friend. Hello, friend. <laughs> um, thanks for being here today and for all of your comments and for everything you're doing now, again, back in government. Um, I just had a question sort of tied to like a little bit with Kevin was saying, but around the cyber solarium recommendations and some of the swirl that's been happening um, legislatively in terms of like incident reporting and things like that. And just would be interested in your perspective on, you know, kind of what's been put forward. Is there anything missing? And like, is there anything we can do collectively in any of our joint sort of sec across sector yeah. efforts to help either support, advance, add, take away, you know, all the things. <laughs> um, so there was a lot in uh, that NDA, let me tell you that, uh, and, and we're still sifting through uh, it and understanding, you know, who's, who's got responsibility for what. I will, I will say CISA's doing a great job with the 9002 piece of it and, you know, looking at how we think about what critical infrastructure is, what a sector risk management agency is, um, how they should be resourced, and that's really important for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we're in a very different place um, when it comes to the risk environment than when you and I worked together in, in 2009. And it's just far more complex. And, you know, this is not your, your mother's um, old sector specific agency. And we really do need to make sure that the departments and agencies are resourced to support our private sector partners. So, you know, hats off to um, Elena and Nitin for their, for their work on, on that report that's due um, to Congress. You know, I think, um, uh, and, and we're working very closely with Chris Inglis to get the National Cyber Directorate stood up. And, um, you know, I think Chris really has a unique opportunity to, I, I call him kind of like the cyber accountabilities are at the White House, right, to make sure that departments and agencies are really doing what they're supposed to be doing. And by having um, oversight of, of budgets and the ability to do program reviews to better understand where there are gaps, where departments and agencies may need more authority to be their voice, you know, um, up, up on the Hill. Um, so that's been really exciting and he's up and running and there's a lot of you know, CISA alumni that are going to go support it. So I think that's going to just strengthen um, the overall posture. The, the thing that we're trying to wrap our head around right now, um, Christine, is the, the um, continuity of the economy uh, deliverable that's due. That's a pretty massive um, undertaking. And so uh, I think at some point we're going to have to come back out to the private sector uh, once we get ourselves organized in government to tackle that one. But that's a big um, big report. I think it's, um, you know, very, it's the way we need to be thinking strategically. Uh, but that's, that's going to be a lift and one where we're going to have to work very closely with the private sector community. Thank you very much. Okay, thank it's you. Fantastic yeah. to okay. have the White House representative okay. here today. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, everyone.